Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Sam. I have signed my contract. I did it last night, and I'm just about to do my work, so hopefully I will get paid after. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Millie Harrison, and I live in Glasgow in the People's Republic of Scotland. And I am very excited to be here as part of Transmedia. It's my first time at this festival, and I've heard about it a lot. And I have even applied to be in it in the past and been rejected. So this is a real honor to finally make it onto this stage. So, a bit of history. Can I get my slide? Ah. Uh, this is me 10 years ago, uh, the daily data logger. It was a character that I created for this exhibition that I curated in 2005 called Day to Day Data. Um, and I described this character in the book as an enthusiastic, data collecting obsessive, so, clean on, so keen on measuring and quantifying the things that surround her that she permanently dresses in a tracksuit for easy maneuverability and wears the utility belt jam-packed with data collecting devices. So back then I was on a mission to capture all. This character, um, although a fiction as such, is just a kind of exaggerated version of the reality that I was living at that time because at this at this point in my life um, when I was age 26 I was midway through a series of these 16 massive data collecting uh, projects which I undertook from between 2001 and 2008 where I aimed to document different elements of my everyday life in ever more extreme ways so I photographed everything that I ate for a year to start off with. 1,640 um, meals and snacks individually documented and recorded uh, alongside this huge spreadsheet. Then I set about trying to record the total distance that I traveled on London transport. This is when I used to live in England um, over the course of a year, which amounted to more than 9,210 kilometers, which is the same as traveling from Ealing Broadway, which is in the west of London, where I'm actually from, to Shanghai in a straight line. Um, I then recorded the exact time of every sneeze that I did in 2003. Uh, that was 318 to be precise, and there they are all, all, all neatly displayed in, in this installation. I recorded every single swear word that I uttered in 2005 uh, for my online swear box, including details of the outburst, and if you rolled over them, you got details of the cause of each of them. And then I recorded the exact thing that I was thinking about every time I had a hot drink for three years for this Project T blog which concluded in 2008. Now, all of this was done the hard way, laboriously counting and manually measuring, noting things down in my notebook before Oyster cards, that's our automated uh, travel cards in London, before smartphones, before apps, before social media even. So. Looking back on all of this activity, which I, which I do a lot, it's pretty unsurprising, given the amount of additional data processing that I was imposing on myself, that it felt as though the boundaries between life and work had completely dissolved, and the possibility of leisure had been completely pushed out the window. And it was this feeling that I was always at work that led me on to doing what I call my most extreme data collecting activity of all time. And it's the one that I am showing as part of the Time in Motion show um, here at Transmedia Early. And it's called Timelines from 2006. So my aim was to try to track and visualize just exactly how I was spending every moment of my time to see whether this feeling that I was always at work was actually true and to test whether I'd be able to distinguish and differentiate between work and leisure and of course all those grey areas in between. 
So I set about trying to document everything I did 24 hours a day for a period of four weeks, 28 days. And again, this was done the old school way. I had a watch which had a very big uh, display so I could quickly uh, gr grasp the time from a quick glance. And I had two notebooks. And the way I did it was to categorize my time uh, into 17 different possible activities and then to simply note the time when I switched from doing one of those to the next. And this process um, required probably about two hours of additional data processing every day where I typed up everything that I'd collected into my notebooks into a huge spreadsheet. I think had more than 2,000 entries by the end of four weeks. Um, so in, in the show here, I'm, just sh I'm showing five of the 28 color-coded timelines that I produced as a result of this. And I should give a shout out to my sister actually because she's an expert in Excel. And she helped me to produce these. She might even be watching on the, on the live stream. Um, but she managed to kind of hack into Excel so we could change the spreadsheet data into these beautiful things. Um, but this process of continual self-monitoring drove me insane. Because I couldn't just be present in the moment, and I'm sure any live trackers that are out there will empathize, because there was always the pressure to try to document it. Um, and I finally came to the realization that this obsessive and introspective self-monitoring wasn't in the slightest bit healthy. And this realization occurred at the same time that new technologies were emerging to make this sort of behavior and this sort of processes even easier and more accessible to more people. So in 2009, I, I published this book, Confessions of a Recovering Data Collector, and if, if you would like one, there, there are a couple of copies here or in the shop. Um, and it's a warning to my fellow human beings. It offers an insight into, uh, into the negative side effects um, of data collecting and the impact that it has on mental health. So a few of my confessions. I can't read that without my glasses on. Um, it was horrible feeling so trapped. I couldn't do anything without generating and accumulating data, especially in the timelines project, actually, because on the first morning I had to just lie in my bed because I was too terrified to get up because then I would be like having to document that. Um, I felt as though I was spending hours each week employed as the administrator to my own life. Then maybe more importantly, I was so focused on the minutiae of my everyday life that I became totally blinkered to everything else going on in the world outside. And then finally, this is one of the therapist reports from inside the book, and you can read these in detail. Um, Web 2.0, as we used to call it in those days, has spawned a whole new generation of data collectors. There is now such a ridiculous abundance of boring information about other people's lives on the internet that I felt obliged to stop adding to it. So, I quit. And I quickly realized, actually, that I could use these extreme powers of self-discipline and self-control that I had developed to create barriers and distinctions to help separate out my time, to redress that so-called life-work balance. Um, and many of these uh, strategies of resistance follow in the tradition of the Luddites, who were probably peers of um, Robert Owen, maybe a little bit before, um, by turning against the technology which I saw as being the most oppressive of forces. So some of my strategies of resistance that I practice in my own everyday life now is first one is to have a separate place for work. So I go to my studio to work and then when I leave in the evening I pack my laptop up and I lock it in the drawer and I leave it there overnight and I never watch films, I never watch TVs, I've never in my whole life watched a box set. I barely even know what they are. 
nothing on my laptop. My laptop is only for work. I don't have the internet at home, and I don't have a smartphone yet. Soon you're not going to be able to get these things anymore. Um, stupid people have smartphones. That's my motto, but I probably shouldn't say it here. Um, anyway, no offence. Um, the, the other thing um, I've developed is strict rules to moderate my engagement with social media. So, I've been running this Twitter boycott for approximately, well, more than, getting on for seven years. Um, and as it says here, the former tea blogger who has learned the perils of instantaneous ego broadcasting and now runs this active Twitter boycott. So I haven't tweeted yet, and I don't ever intend to, but it's been sitting there for seven years, and it is always like a, a, a conscious temptation um, to, 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 break, to break that. And with Facebook, I've had a love-hate relationship since I first signed up in 2006, and I've just cracked it. Last year, I just cracked it, okay? So... I deleted my personal profile, and I only exist on Facebook as an artist, as a professional, for work, okay? Um, and it does exactly what it says on the tin, facebook.com slash blatant self-promotion. Um, so you can, you can, you can like me, um, but this distinction means that I know when I log on, it's only work. I have to have this kind of ghost profile so I can be an admin to my own page, and this is what it looks like. It is so calm. Um, I, I, I love that. I log on that. It's, it used to be, like, in the chat, I love this. It's, it used to say, nobody is available right now. And it's because I didn't have any friends. <laughs> but I love that because it was just, like, so stressful every time I logged on when I used to be a human being on, on Facebook. Um, but I, I don't simply want to withdraw and not to participate. Because I don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater because data collecting and my early adoption of these internet technologies has given me some really good skills which I want to put to better use. Um, so since quitting data collecting, um, the main aim, um, my main aim has been to re-channel what I see as that ingrained and very hard to shift neoliberal work ethic. Um, and particularly for me, my obsessive and inquisitive qualities, to channel that away from self-analysis and to channel it into exposing and challenging the flaws in our wider political and economic systems. So I always ask myself now, who is profiting from my labor? And more importantly, for what, in what cause, for what cause is my self-exploitation? So to cut a very long story short, I now um, invest huge amounts of my time in running uh, political campaigns, and specifically this one, which I uh, set up in 2009 to popularise the idea of returning Britain's railways to public ownership following their disastrous privatisation in 2004. Uh, but that is completely another lecture altogether. Um, the campaign has grown to number nearly 100,000 supporters over the last five years, not that I'm counting, of course, and has led to um, incidents in which happy marriages of self-promotion um, and uh, slightly more altruistic and, and selfless goals um, have, have occurred. So what with all these strict rules that I've imposed to regulate uh, my relationship to, to technology, you'd think that I'd have it all sorted by now, wouldn't you? You'd think that I'd be living the dream, that I'd accomplish this really sought-after life-work balance. But actually, over the last few years, it hasn't really felt like that. In fact, if anything, I think it's got even worse than it was in 2006. So, finally, um, 
I turned, old habits die hard, I turned to some hardcore data analysis again to help me understand. And last year I produced uh, what I call my progress report. And in doing this, I began to notice a glaring contradiction in the way that I was living my life. Because I'm somebody who, who is concerned about climate change. That is why I'm so passionate about public transport, in case you're wondering. And I really believe um, that the only solution to many of the problems that we face in the world is for us to begin to move towards a no-growth or a steady-state economy. And yet, in terms of my own life's trajectory, as you can see from the data here, if measured in these two reductive scales, um, the number of emails that I'm sending and the distance that I'm swimming in my local swimming pool, it appears that I am simply following the trajectory of capitalism. I'm mirroring its growth fetish, its demand for continual infinite progress on a finite planet, or in my case, within the limits of what human, one human body can endure. This is obviously unsustainable. Um, and like capitalism's recurring periods of crisis, I'm sure it's only going to end in tears. And for anybody who went to that optimized self-screening last night, that guy, that, um, that Hungarian guy, like, I mean, he's a bit of a hero for me now, but he was crying at the end, and we all wonder why. Why is this? Okay, so these are the big questions that I'm going to end on. Why is this, um, and what can be done about it? That's what I'm thinking about now, and that's maybe something that we can feed into the discussion. Thanks.